Okay, we are currently at the one minute mark. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Erskine. I saw that you guys had your blue jackets on, so I went and put mine on as well. Well, mine is actually uh, gray. I was trying to keep with the Alabama colors. Oh, well, I need to upgrade my computer there. It good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all so much again. Uh, we want to thank our many uh, community members. We want to thank the, uh, first let me thank the Black Faculty and Staff Association. Thank the entire e-board, the entire membership of the University of Alabama. I want to thank our UA community partners. I want to thank all those individuals who have uh, registered from all over the country. Uh, we have people from Duke University. We have people from Drake University. We have people from all over the South. And we want to thank you for um, joining in to this, what we believe will be a very monumental conversation. I won't hold you long. Um, I'll go ahead and do the intros and step out of the way so that these scholars can navigate this conversation so it can um, assist us and, and help us and bless us as we need it, to, uh, as these times call for. So uh, for those of you who know, and I'm going to ask everyone, if you don't mind, please make sure you're muted because uh, you will steal the screen if you're not. So thank you for that. Um, what? What brought me to these two individuals, one was relationship with uh, Dr. Erskine. And through that relationship, I had the opportunity to um, virtually meet Dr. Chance Lewis. But now I believe we have started something. We would just have to be to be continued <laughs> uh, as, as life progressed and as we um, address these uh, current times. I read the book and in case you all, uh, you have seen our media, it's the dilemmas of being an African-American male in the new millennium. And I was thinking, what other time but now to have this conversation, not casually, but have it in the academic and theological review. So once doing that, uh, I realized that these two individuals were the perfect persons to facilitate this conversation. And when you get the book, you uh, understand it's the duality of the, of the, the statue of it. One section speaks about the issues and the other uh, section uh, looks at the solutions. And I'm pretty much uh, convinced that once you read this, this, this book and once you enjoy the seminar webinar today, you will go out and get it. Uh, actually, uh, some of our uh, media kind of let people know that we're looking for anyone who would like to sponsor a book for some of our youth please get in contact with us. And we want to make sure we put this book into the hands of our black young men. So what I will do, I will step out the way now and I will allow Dr. Chance Lewis and uh, Dr. Chris Erskine to, they're going to self-facilitate. They've done this enough times that they don't really need me, but I will be on standby should you ask and should you need anything. And right now we will have their introductions. Thank you gentlemen so well and welcome. Uh, Chad, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I want to say how honored I am to be here with my friend and my brother, uh, Dr. Chance Lewis, who is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I'm here in Birmingham, Alabama, but I'm grateful to each of you who are not only on this Zoom, but for those of you who are hosting watch parties and those of you who are logging on and tagging other people to this, the, the plight of the black male and black man is uh, so prevalent that this is a conversation that should have continue to take place. Uh, it stops and starts uh, with your Trayvon Martins, your Tamir Rice, your uh, George Floyds, and it continues to pick up after a tragedy. But I believe if we're going to be, um, if we're going to have success we have to continue to have this conversation and to navigate through some of the uh, issues that continue to present themselves to uniquely black men that do, that do not pre uh, present themselves to any other type of man. Uh, Dr. Lewis and I uniquely met in College Station, Texas um, in 2003, 2004. He and his beautiful family moved from Denver, Colorado to College Station where he was a uh, professor at the university there in, uh, at Texas A&M. He and his wife and daughters became a member of our church. 
and we formed a wonderful friendship. Uh, after one Sunday, he came to me and said, Pastor E, we're supposed to do something together. And I said, what is that? And he said, we're supposed to write a book together. And I said, well, no, I said, you're the author, you're the writer, you're the professor. He said, but yeah, you have a heart and a passion for our community and our people. And so we thought it would be uh, purpose that we would join um, church and classroom together, academia and anointing to come together and kind of bridge the gap over some conversations that were losing their longevity in certain areas. They would go so far in the community and the church arena and then from the classroom to the professors and it would lose its longevity but not reach one another and so we penned this book 2008 the first addiction of it and uh, it was phenomenal we were able to address on the first six chapters of the book the ills that we saw that played uh, black men and then rather than just continue to speak on the issues, we decided to have the next six chapters deal with the solutions. And so I want to, at this time, segue and allow Dr. Um, Chance Lewis to give introduction and share from his heart and to also speak to um, the reason why this Zoom and others are so needed at this time. Thank you, Dr. Erskine, and all for all who are joining, uh, welcome. Uh, I know we have people around the country, so I'm so excited. Thank you to Mr. Jackson for the invitation. I really appreciate it. And as Dr. Erskine mentioned, um, the, the importance of today's conversation is paramount in what we see from the, the long list of uh, African-American males who you know, have been killed uh, prematurely uh, into looking at what are the root causes and, and systems that are in place uh, that uh, lead to this particular process. So in my time today, and Dr. Erskine and I will be going back and forth uh, for today, I wanna just lay out uh, an argument that I want us to consider because oftentimes when we think about the issue related to black men, uh, many people isolated to an individual community or you know something is wrong with that particular person. Uh, but what I want to just kind of share with us today uh, is just a, a bigger picture of what you can uh, kind of consider and you know once you pick up the book you can kind of see uh, the in-depth uh, nature of how we go into it particularly the solutions but to just start us off for today I'm going to just share my screen for a second to lay out a, a context for everybody uh, and where we're going today uh, as well so in, in sharing my screen hopefully you all can see that so based on this before I, I do that uh, I, I found something from the University of Alabama uh, showing, <laughs> showing this. Uh, and I wanted to read something as we go into today's conversation. It shows uh, what is it about uh, Alabama that is important, right? It says, founded in 1831 as the state's flagship institution, the University of Alabama has always focused on being the best. And <laughs> this is where legends are made. Now, some may say, well, you know, that's relegated to football or that's relegated to particular academic programs. But I wanna challenge us today that anybody that's affiliated with the, uh, the university that also pertains to you uh, as right. well. So as we look at this then, here are the two versions of the book uh, that we, we, we did the first edition and the second edition on the right, which we'll be talking from today. And what I want us to think about for today, I'm gonna lay out some issues that I think are important. What's the status of the black male right now 2020 uh, as it relates to what's going on. So you see right here, this is the median household income in black households versus white households. So when you start to look at this from a systematic structure, you know, when you look at just the, the household income, you know, there are some questions that arise, you know, just by looking at this, but this is the status right now. If I go further real quickly, here's the median male earnings uh, weekly for black men versus white men, okay? And as you start to think about this, as we paint the picture for today's conversation, 
uh, in each one of these uh, slides that I will show you today, I think it's going to be important because there are questions under the questions in this data that we have to make sure that we pay attention to. Okay, this is the male unemployment rate in 2020. Okay, so you look at black men, 6%, roughly 6.6, .6, and white men, 3.3, .3, so about half as much. So as we look at this, what is causing that and what are the stressors that that bring to black men, their communities, their families as well? Home ownership rate. So, you know, one, one person would say, hey, well, you know, we should all just be able to go out and get a home and do what we need to do. But there are structures in place uh, that, you know, are, are barriers to that as well that we don't often think about. And um, for all of my, my people on, you know, I, I put my source information on there <laughs> in case you need that while further discussion. Uh, but let's look at this, let's zone in on this. You know, most people want houses for their families, but look at the mortgage application denial rates, right? So they wanna do it, okay? But look at the rates that they are denied, okay? Black men are denied uh, in comparison to their white counterparts. So as we think about this, these are all dilemmas that are going on when you look at the plight and the pathway of black males as well, okay? So then what does that mean? If you can't get a home at the same rate, okay? And most people's homes are tied into their net worth in some form or fashion and, and equity that's tied to it. But look at the net worth of, of black men in comparison to white males uh, as well, okay? And so one would assume that, and we know it's not true, but we, one would assume that we're all on a level playing field and we all start at the same starting point, okay? But that is not the case uh, as well, okay? And then so when you have a home, even if you are able to get a home, right, based on what we described earlier, then um, the way the system is set up in many ways, you know, it doesn't have the same equity and value that's tied to it, okay? So that's other dilemmas that are going on in the black male's life uh, as they move forward. Now, from being an educator myself, one of the things that I wanna look at, if you kind of drill down further for our conversation today, uh, is that our young black men that are in schools, you know, we, we often tell students to go to school, you know, pay attention and, and you know, get a good education, but look at what's happening even down at the education level, black males, are more than likely to have a teacher who does not even have an undergrad major in the subject that they're teaching, right? So they're, they are in the classroom, but have not a lot of working knowledge around what they're teaching. So when you look at different levels of exposure to high quality teachers, you know, that also is a dilemma uh, that, that plays a part uh, as well. So in looking forward to this, you know, and, and our unemployment rates and all these other things as well, you know, look at the difference between those black male students who have teachers with less than three years of experience, okay? So they're more than likely to have a teacher in their classroom who one, does not have a degree in the subject area that they're teaching. And then two, more than likely to have teachers that are not as experienced in the classroom. Okay, so when you take all of that together, you know, what we're saying for today uh, is that, and I'll stop sharing at this point, and I'll come back to the solutions after Dr. Erskine, is that once we start to look at this in framing our conversation for today, uh, we want to know based on uh, data that is uh, available around the country, and even I could pull this same data for uh, the state of Alabama or any state uh, in the country and the data is the same no matter where I pull it from, that African-American males face a different set of dilemmas uh, than their white male counterparts or uh, their male counterparts from different races. So thus, that is the foundation of this book, The Dilemmas of Being an African-American Male and how it's important that we address many of these issues uh, for them as well. So I'll turn it to Dr. Erskine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chance. I wanted to continue the conversation with um, two of the chapters in the book that I was privileged to, to pen, um, one in the vertical relationship with God and also the horizontal relationship 
um, that they have with others. Um, uniquely, it forms a cross um, that is the, the prototype for a purpose. Uh, if an individual does not have a proper working relationship um, virtually, um, virtually, then they will not in any way uh, have a sustainable relationship horizontally. And we see from that, um, that times have shifted and times have changed. And most times mothers are asking me, Pastor Erskine, what can I do to get my son in church? What can I do to get my husband in church? What can I do to get you in church? And most times I have to tell sisters, stop trying to be Jesus, stop trying to be God, stop trying to be um, all that they need and allow him to have space into their lives. We're raising a generation for the very first time who have not been led by men. If you can wrap your mind around that, um, you go back to that builder's generation um, that was in the 1920s up to the 1940s. That generation had a solid father in the home, uh, black ma man who worked and came home, uh, was the breadwinner, uh, and that family understood him to be that lead in the home. Well, time shifted from those builders to the bus, to those boomer generations where life kind of shifted for us. And a lot of the core values that they once had in the home with that vertical relationship and that horizontal relationship, uh, it shift, the paradigm of it shift. And so now you're having the emergence of young black males and young black men being raised by single parents or single mothers or single fathers. And what happens then is that fabric of the community is ripped. But even to go deeper into what is, I believe, uh, systemic is that you have a government that had perpetuated uh, the removal of the black male from the house and from the community. So you started back in the late 60s early 70s with President Nixon, and you work your way all the way up through Reagan, and even through our beloved Clinton, you have prison rates that are higher for African American males than they are for their counterparts. And I believe it was a part of the plan systematically to remove the black male, black father, black uncle, grandfather from the community. When I was growing up, uh, my mother was a single parent, and what I was so most proud of now, looking back in retrospect, is that there was a village and a community of Black men who surrounded me, who first were not trying to date my mother, was not trying to win brownie points with me, but they had a sense of responsibility in the community that this was another young Black male boy who needed guidance. And I believe we have left that fabric. We have left that prototype. And so our young men now do not have that wherewithal to pour back into the community as such, to be that father in the home because they didn't see it. And so with it, it can be easily made as a crutch and an excuse for others. But I believe it also becomes a responsibility and a mantle that others take up. And so. I want to try to do this. Uh, I want to share screen um, and I'm a believer that beliefs shape behaviors. Uh, I believe that when you uh, shape your beliefs, your beliefs will shape your behaviors. Uh, one of the things that I also want to share today is these three young men or three men, African-American black men, um, prevalent in some area of athletics. There you have Allen Iverson, who was a first round draft pick for the Philadelphia 76ers. You have Michael Vick, who was a first round draft pick for the Atlanta Falcons. And there you have LeBron James, who's a first round draft pick for the Cleveland Cavaliers. All of them successful black men on the field, on the court. The only difference is I will ask you, what separates them? What makes them different? Well, Allen Iverson and, and LeBron James both played basketball. Michael Vick played football. That's an obvious distinction. But there's something deeper there that if you look at it, if you look at it systemically, 
Allen Iverson, when he signed his rookie contract for multi millions of dollars, his group, his friends, his partners, his associates, one person called his posse, they decided what we're going to do is go to a strip club and we're going to make it rain and we're going to have a wonderful time off of your success. Michael Vick went to prison, not because he was fighting dogs, but because his associates and those who were connected to him were fighting dogs and having dog fighting on his property. And then there's LeBron James. LeBron James, many can say many negative things about his game and about how he plays and if he's the GOAT, but that's really not my conversation piece today. My conversation piece is about his uh, association, his friends. They are called the Four Horsemen, Randy Mims, LeBron James, Maverick Carter, Rick Paul. These four men were called the Four Horsemen in high school, and they deemed that as their group name. LeBron graduated from high school, 18 years old, signed a $90 million contract with Nike. That is separate from his rookie multi-million dollar MBA contract. What he does is he doesn't go to college. He's not afforded to go to college because he goes straight from high school to professional sports. But he sends Randy Mims to school. He sends Maverick Carter to college. He sends Rick Paul to college. And all of them now work together under the LeBron James band brand in some kind of way. I said all of that to say this, that your associations will also give you assimilations. It will always assign you to a very lane of life. And I believe if we're going to change the fabric of black men, we got to change those associations that they have. But this same picture that I'm showing you now of, uh, of black men and um, go back. These black men who have relationships with one another. I can also show you young African-American black males who are in prison. And if I were to ask them, what was your fabric of friends? What did your group look like? And most of them tell the way that it was the people who were not productive people who were not educated, people who didn't see putting values and morals ahead of their own grind of life of themselves. And so with that, we must be very careful to label, as Dr. Chance Lewis said earlier, one individual, because this is a community, obviously as a community issue. And because it's communal, I believe that we have to change the fabric of the entire community and get us back on course from where our bridgers and our busters and bloomers generations are. Our millennials are crying out. We see that with Black Lives Matter. We see it, that they have the John Lewis spirit. They have the Martin and Malcolm spirit in them. But now they want more. They don't want to just be at the table. They want to have conversations. They want to make sure that these systems are broken down. I close with this and digress with this. Uh, we had just the other night what many would call a debate. There is no way I can label it a debate. It was more of a debacle um, because it was uh, at the highest level of disrespect. And I believe that was on both sides. I don't believe it was just on the president's side. I believe uh, Biden had some comments that made him seem unpresidential at certain times. Um, but when you attack a man's family, what is he supposed to do? And that's what I'm saying now to black men. Our families are under attack. When a Breonna Taylor is shot in her home, in her apartment, in her bed, and she is killed in her home, it's time for black men to stand up and take charge over our communities and over our families. Thank you, Dr. Erskine. So as we continue our conversation and, and now have a context that Dr. Erskine mentioned about LeBron James and Allen Iverson and Michael Vick and translating that to today's time, one of the things that we have to think about 
now, uh, particularly at the University of Alabama that is, you know, so graciously hosting this event and the Black Faculty Staff Association, you know, we have now have to think about our roles because what is the role of different community agencies such as a university or a community agency like a church, faith-based community, uh, and all of the stakeholders that interact with the University of Alabama uh, as well, because on game day at the University of Alabama, we know how to come together uh, in such a way that there is a unique school spirit uh, that is surrounded, ironically, around a uh, majority of Black men who are playing on the team. And so, but what happens on uh, Sunday through Friday, okay? And when we start to look at that, there's also a unique role. So one of the things Dr. Erskine and I wanted to do is make sure that uh, we not only highlighted issues, but we highlighted solutions. And due to the brevity of time today, we can't walk you through uh, every solution that we put forward. So that's why we hope you pick up the book. Uh, but what I wanted to do today, and I know we have other universities that are watching outside of the University of Alabama, but the, the solutions that I'm going to put forth here for us to consider can be applicable uh, to any university uh, as well in our different roles because we all play a part. <clears throat> so as we look at this, I wanted to, uh, for us to think about this in, in our first solution that I wanna kind of put some conversation around because uh, as a student myself who, uh, for many in education, cause I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and you know, by many accounts, you know, by societal kind of expectations, I had the wrong address. If everybody knows what I mean when I say that, uh, right. I the, the wrong family structure, uh, if everybody knows what I mean when I say that. Uh, but then how is it then that a Dr. Lewis and a Dr. Erskine emerge from these communities? And it's like Dr. Erskine said, there had to be some people who wrapped their arms around us to make sure that we were successful. So if the University of Alabama's motto is to simply be the best, then we have a role to play. So the first thing I want us to consider as a solution is that you're gonna have to enhance the black male experience right there at the University of Alabama because of being a professor in, in higher education and knowing the University of Alabama quite well, uh, I'm willing to bet, and I'm pretty sure you know what I mean when I say this, every black male that attends the University of Alabama does not have the same kind of experience. Right. And so when we start to look at that then, how do we make that experience positive? Because the information that I showed earlier provides a context into what's waiting for them right outside of that campus. So that one is remarkable, they made it to your campus, okay? But now two, once they are at your campus and the model is that we simply want to be the best, what kind of experience are we providing for these particular students when they matriculate on our campus, okay? But then also with the supports, how do we ensure graduation? Okay, because as we look at the information I provided earlier to change their trajectory, if we look at a Dr. Lewis and a Dr. Erskine with the people who wrap their arms around us, you know, they had a goal in mind for us, but they also made sure that we graduated in our educational pursuits. You know, so as we look at this, there can be no other option for any black men that come to your campus not to graduate. The University of Alabama has too many resources, too much funds and the endowment not to ensure that. And so as we think about this, for all of us and whatever we role we play at the university, that has to be a central focus because as I've said earlier, each of these particular students have dilemmas that they've had to overcome to get to that point. But since they are at the University of Alabama who wants them to be the best, we have to ensure that they graduate no matter what. And secondly, I want us to re-envision at the University of Alabama, whatever university that you're watching from, the role in job creation and hiring in the state. Because University of Alabama has enormous influence in the state of Alabama, because if the university galvanized and said, 
we want to promote job creation, particularly for underserved communities, it could happen in a heartbeat, okay? So this is why we have to re-envision that role of the University of Alabama in job creation and hiring in the state because so much and so many people are directly tied to your university where uh, a lot of that can happen with a phone call that, from many people that you already know. Uh, next, uh, as a university person, universities create uh, centers when they uh, want to make sure something happens. So what if we had a center for home ownership to build partnerships with banks in that state of Alabama focus on improving the loan process for black males uh, as well. Okay, so as we start to look at this, I'm gonna go to Dr. Erskine real quick. I have some noise in the background. So Dr. Erskine, you wanna jump in? I sure will. Uh, one of the things too that um, Dr. Prince to is accountability. And in the solutions section of our second edition, uh, in that second chapter, mending um, the breach and the barriers between relationships. Uh, I talked about how in the first edition, how those families were broken. And I don't believe that there is anyone who comes from a perfect family. I believe there is dysfunction in every, some people hide it better than others. But I believe that when you really look at the, the root of all of our families, that there is some type of dysfunction uh, that we were able to survive and able to push our way through. Uh, uniquely in that mending the relationships, there is a, a men, remen, uh, forgive me, for amending and mending the relationships um, with the family. That they must take accountability. One thing I will share with you being transparent is that uh, our church is connected to um, one of the prisons here in the state of Alabama. And um, I'll share that briefly and then come back uh, when Dr. Lewis is, is completely accountability uh, is the structure or the brick and, and, and the foundation that we must work on some of that he shared, and that I'll, I'll go back to him now. Okay, so based on that, then when we look at these connections and these solutions that I was talking about earlier, and going back here, uh, I think the thing that's important for us to, to realize going back to the, the ownership, I want to go back to that because this is important because so much of um, our country's equity and net worth is tied to the American dream, as they call it, of owning a home, right? And in the information that I showed earlier uh, is that I was saying that in the, at the universities, they create centers when they want to focus on something that they deem important, that they want to move forward uh, in such a meaningful way. So at the University of Alabama and any other university that's watching today, you know, I want us to consider you know, having a center with entities and many stakeholders on campus that their sole focus is on home ownership and building partnerships with banks uh, for improving the loan process for African-American males because there is something systematically wrong with uh, a black male and a white male going to a bank with the same dream of providing a home to their family. But one group uh, has a denial rate double that of another group, okay? And it's not just individual characteristics, right? We've all heard of things like redlining of communities and things of that nature to kind of ostracize, um, you know, the, the value of a community, you know, the value of a home or, or what value we perceive a neighborhood to be. Uh, but these are two men going into the same bank, for example, wanting to provide a safe home and haven for their families, right? But what if the University of Alabama took a lead and all of us who are representing 
that to push initiatives such as this where the university can partner with the banks in the state to say, hey, we want to make sure that you know, the process is much better for these underserved communities. What about, you know, African-American male students that are in our academic programs, right? How do we help them to let them know once they get their degree, home ownership is important and we're gonna make sure that you are prepared for that. You know, anytime you leave the University of Alabama, these are things that we're talking about when it comes to solutions to bigger issues that the University of Alabama and people who are on this video conference today can play a part in uh, as well. A couple other solutions before I go back to Dr. Erskine is that what about if we had community outreach programs that emanate from the universities, uh, from the university that uh, is focused on programming with black communities to help them understand how to increase their network? Okay, uh, and how to increase equity in home ownership. Okay, because not only do those families win, but the entire community wins, right? And then the university also wins because that is the charge of many universities to impact the communities around them in the particular state that they represent. Because if you go back to a visual uh, of game day, you know, and say roll tide roll, we're not just talking about football, we're talking about a whole university movement, right? But as we start to look at this then, you know, how does it play itself out on a day-to-day -day basis based on solutions for this population that we're talking about today, uh, the African-American males that participate within our campus community uh, as well. One thing I know being an education professor is that uh, preparation of teachers are important in our community. I can pull up in my role, any city in the state of Alabama, any school district, any publicly funded school, and I could sh pretty much show you the same picture that uh, many students, depending on their address, do not have the same quality of education. And also, one thing I can also find out is that uh, the teachers that are in every classroom are not prepared the same. So usually, those, those schools and students that are perceived as undervalued usually get the less quality teachers. Also, uh, they get the least experienced teachers, as I said earlier, but here's an interesting fact for you as well. The University of Alabama is the number one producer of teachers in that state. Yes. So, so as you start to look at that, uh, now you are sending a product out in the community that oftentimes are not prepared to fully address uh, all the students uh, for the state of Alabama. And then uh, finally, uh, with this, before I go back to Dr. Erskine, uh, what will be your legacy based on your role at the university and how you enhance opportunities for black males at that campus? So it does not matter to me whether you're a faculty member, staff member, university administrator, you know, custodian, whatever your role is, okay? there is a way for you to enhance the experience and opportunities uh, for black males that matriculate at that university or whatever university that you're representing. Because as we look at this, okay, and I want us to remember this, these students that attend the University of Alabama still pay tuition, okay? Now, whether it's covered by a football scholarship, basketball scholarship, or there's a student that's just in the academic program, okay? They are part of the University of Alabama legacy. So what I'm saying here that we have to think about in the scope of our book conversation for today and as you start to look through what we wrote based on uh, the different solutions, we all have a part to play in making sure that uh, this population uh, has an uh, opportunity to succeed in a meaningful way because when they then say that I am an alum of the University of Alabama, that should say something because they were prepared so well, not only to uh, have career aspirations, but they can provide for their families, provide a home, you know, make adequate income to support their family and provide opportunities for that next generation as well. So these are just a few solutions that I want us to think about in the scope of today's you know, conversation based on the role that we play uh, as well. So I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Erskine. Thank you, Chance. Um, I will say this. Um, one of the things and solutions that I will add to what Dr. Lewis mentioned 
and that is the black experience. And I believe that we are all purpose to make an experience better for the people who are coming behind us, even though the people in front of us didn't do a great job at providing it for us. And so uh, part of that black experience and, and uh, understanding on that college campus, especially on the capstone, um, bringing young black males, since that's the concept, uh, context of our conversation today, to the campus and not just taking them to Brian Denny, not just taking them to the football game or to uh, the Coliseum for a basketball game or a baseball event. Uh, some of them, the first time that they ever hit the campus and walk across the yard is because someone is trying to recruit them to come to that school. What if we start at first grade, second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, before we are surrounding themselves with the wrong kind of environment and we bring them to the University of Alabama and not just to Brian Denny, not just to the Coliseum where a basketball game is taking place, but what about the College of Engineering? Why don't, why don't we walk them through what it looks like to be a student at the university? What is the real campus like for you, the rigor on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can start shaping their minds? Um, Dr. Lewis, right here, sadly, in the state of Alabama, our governor has uh, executed um, a contract to build three super prisons in the state of Alabama. They're actually now, because of COVID, they have been held up in process. But the progress of those super prisons, hear me, they go to the second grade reading scores of Black males to determine the population of those prisons to come that they're going to build. So let's think about that in context. They're building three super prisons in the state of Alabama to replace some of the outdated prisons that are across the state of Alabama. But they have gone to our communities to grab our children's data to determine which those students would fill those cells. As they are adamant about that process, I believe that we should be as adamant about keeping our young men in the community, keeping them in school, keeping them in our family. We need to, as I have with District Attorney Dan Carr here in the, uh, in the city of Birmingham, Jefferson County, he is the first African-American male elected DA in our county for the very first time in the history of our county, we have a sitting African-American male district attorney. He and I are very close friends. And I say to them, I wanna create, and I love for the University of Alabama, the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, the University of Alabama systems, whether that's UAB or UAH, to all come together collectively to help us with some of these solutions. We have them but we need your assistance because you shouldn't just want African-American males to run touchdowns, catch touchdowns, be first round draft picks. You should want them to be successful in life anyway. And so I said to DA Danny Carr, let's set up a program where we bring young men and young girls to young boys and young girls to the court before they have a case so that they can see how the judicial system is set so that their first time putting a suit on is not because they got to go before a judge. I don't want another call from a parent whose child has been wavered and we need to get them out of some situation. And that's the first time they've been educated uh, about the judicial system. They should know who the judges are, have a sit down conversation with them know who the lawyers are. Um, Dr. Lewis talked about the, cooper um, the cooperative and partnerships that we can form. What every African-American, Black, faculty, student, or person connected to the university, 
felt a sense of ownership with some young black male, some young black boy from the law school and say, hey, listen, we're going back to the community right there in Tuscaloosa. It doesn't have to be Birmingham, but right there in Tuscaloosa, go back into that classroom and say to those young black boys, what is it that you really want to be in life? Uh, Dr. Lewis talked about in Baton Rouge, and me in Birmingham, how those hands in the community came and just began to shape us. They didn't ask for permission. Uh, back then, your parents didn't have to sign off for someone to mentor you. There was no program to go to that when they saw you doing wrong, they chastised you, they corrected you because they knew the ultimate end uh, would be for destruction. And so what happens when we begin to shape that and mold that uh, systematically to where now there is no option. When I was growing up, when Dr. Uh, Lewis was growing up, one of the questions that were prevalent to us was, what do you want to be when you grow up? What is it that you desire to be? When you grow up as a young black boy, when you grow up as a man, what is it that you want to be? That was projected on us in, at six, seven years old, four or five years old. And it continued all the way through our adolescence, our formative years, high school, and ultimately it landed us in college. Our, my, our son now is at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Uh, he's a junior, rising junior there on campus. Um, he knew in the first grade, every day that I would take him to school, that he would have the question asked to him, where are you going to college? And as a first grader, he would say, I don't know. I said, perhaps you don't know, but you do know you're going. You have options. You start to embed that into them early. You start to supply that to them early, building that foundation into them early, giving them options. Because the other option, as I was alluding to earlier, was that there is a place called Donaldson Correctional Facility, West Jefferson Prison, 1,700 inmates, all males. And our church has a phenomenal relationship with Chaplain Adams. And we go into that prison at least three to four times a year ministering to those men. I'm connected now because of that to a organization called Prison Fellowship, because I believe that the church's responsibility is more than just Sunday morning. I believe that we should be partnering and creating those kind of relationships and partnerships and cooperatives like this with uh, Dr. Chance Lewis at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa with Dr. Chad um, Jackson. I believe those are the roles and responsibilities of church now. Yes, we ought to sing and shout and have a great time. But I had just last night in route to Bible study, an emergency call from a friend who said that one of our young men, 41 years old, life had been taken. I'm in route to Bible study. I can choose to go on to Bible study and teach Bible study, or I can suspend Bible study or assign it to one of our other ministers on staff, and I can go and be with that family. My choice was to go to be with that family, not just because of the, the closeness that I had with this young man and the closeness that I have with that family, but I believe that historically, church, we have a responsibility to our community. I believe, and I'll honestly say this, I believe that the the, the clergy pulpit pastor has failed the young man. And I'll go on record on saying that for so many who will not, because we will always preach to them on Sunday, but we won't mentor them through the week. And here's a 41 year old man whose now life has been taken, but the, the heart of the community is, but in the last year, his life changed because he met Serskin who didn't judge him on his life or judge him on his lifestyle or bring up his past and remind him of who he used to be, that he had done some things that were not pleasing and that he wasn't proud of. 
but to advance him forward, to start speaking purpose into his life, to start saying to him, like this book, you got to mend some of those relationships in your life. You got to get a vertical relationship. You got to deal with all of these socioeconomic status and um, chokeholds that they place on us. There's more to the George Floyd issue of the knee on the neck uh, of a George Floyd on a pavement, asphalt pavement in Minneapolis. That knee is on the neck of black men every day. That's what Dr. Lewis was uh, sharing with us in each of those solutions that we bring out in the book, that it's hard for a black man to say, I want to do X, Y, and Z, and those doors of opportunity open for them. And so there are 1,700 brothers at West Jefferson Correctional Facility. Dr. Lewis Christian came home for spring break last year. He said, Dad, what's on your schedule for this week? I told him, he said, if you don't mind, I would love to go into the prison with you uh, on my spring break. Now, this is a seven, this is a 19-year-old college student who wants to go into the prison prison ministry on spring break. And I believe it, it has nothing to do exceptional with his mother and I rearing and how we raised him and all of that. I think that has a part in it, but I also believe that it is um, the life that we placed in front of him very early and that we didn't say one thing and do another thing in front of them, that we were transparent and we were real. And I tell people, although I'm a pastor and I'm also a community leader and a faith leader, I'm a man, I'm a husband, I'm a guy, I like to have fun, I laugh. I was texting some friends and we were going back and forth on Facebook about the game after this tragedy last night. And do you know, I had some people who said to me, it's amazing you're a pastor and you come in on LeBron James and the game. It's people dying and going to hell while you come in on the game. I said, well, they would be dying and going to hell if I wasn't coming on the game. I believe we got to be real and transparent and not live our lives in a fishbowl or an aquarium and where we're not real. One of the things that this young man and those 1700 brothers at Donaldson really appreciate is that real men follow real men. I'm gonna say that again. Real men can follow real men. Black men need real black men that they can follow. Not someone who is trying to be something that they're not, trying to project a platform that they do not have the privilege to stand on or to rob so much away from the community, never to go back to the hood that brought you, raised you and reared you. I believe that there is a responsibility to those 1700 brothers that when they finish their time, paid their debt to society, when they come home, there ought to be something that we're offering them, whether it is the extension program at the University of Alabama where they can go back and get their education or get their education while they're in prison, something must be set up so that we can change the trajectory of these men. I close with this, that there was a gentleman I met who was there 42 years. He had been in prison as long as I had been alive. And I said to him, I said, what are your goals when you come out? He said to me, he said, uh, Pastor Erskine, what do you mean? Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I've been in here 42 years. I'm in my late 60s now. By the time I get out, I'll probably be in my late 70s. I said, but what is your plan? You still need to have a plan. I said, having a plan will help you to do the time. Having a plan will give you the ingenuity and insight and the morale and the motivation to push through this. You will have something to live for if you set goals and have accountability even now. I said to him, I'm coming back in a few months. When I come back, I want you to have listed your goals. What are your benchmarks? What is it that you want to accomplish before you leave this place called Earth. Ultimately, I was asking him that you were created to solve. Every person, every black male was created to solve some problem 
that the world is experiencing at this very moment. I believe that systematically they've been locked away, they've been shut down, knee on their neck, mouths closed, all because they do not have the opportunity to step on platforms and give what they've been purposed to give. Yes, thank you, Dr. Erskine. And, and as we get ready to close and open up for questions, uh, hopefully you see the, the passion that we both bring to this particular topic because it's not just a, a academic exercise to write a book. This is, you know, who we are. Uh, so we do hope that you do pick up a copy of the book uh, as well and really dive in on the solutions that we put forward. And just to let you know, um, we'll let Dr. Jackson know as well on uh, November 1st, we will be releasing uh, a set of on-demand videos that will be available for you to uh, purchase and download where we take each of the chapters in the book with the dilemmas and really walk through in more in depth with more time uh, the solutions and how you can be part of the solutions in your respective communities uh, as well. So we want to thank you for uh, being here and we'll turn it over to Dr. Jackson to facilitate uh, any questions that anyone may want to ask. Uh, thank you for uh, speaking so prophetically. It's not Dr. Just yet. Um, Dr. <laughs> Harris, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Nikita Harris is on the call. She's one of our awesome professors. Uh, she has a question. If you would kindly unmute and ask her question, please. Good afternoon. Thank you, um, Dr. Erson and Dr. Lewis for um, uh, speaking on this panel, uh, especially during uh, this particular time, bringing this type of discussion to the University of Alabama. I was listening to a lot of what you said and I was, and, and, and getting to those, talking about those solutions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna share with you a couple of thoughts that came to mind as you all were, were speaking. I kept saying, I think they're, I think they're kind of preaching to the choir. Um, they need to be talking to my white colleagues on faculty. Um, and then secondly, um, because a lot of us, I, I'm, I'm known as that professor who gets into the weeds with students in terms, and, and when I look at a lot of my other colleagues, just not at the University of Alabama, but, but around, they do as well. But it's, it's, it's mostly women. Um, and one of the things that I had to look at in terms of myself, I, I mentor a lot of black men. OK, and I kept on saying, what is this about? You know, you know, why are they why are they why are they drawn to me? OK, to mentor. And I had to look around. Um, and this is probably my fourth campus that I've, I've worked at. But I had to look around and, and, and I come to this uh, understanding from in terms of how I see it, that there's an issue in terms of recruiting diverse African-American men on faculty. And you said black men follow black men. Um, well, first, in order for them to follow anyone, you have to have um, a diverse faculty. And when I'm talking about diverse in personalities, diverse in backgrounds, sometimes I kind of see where um, a, a lot of the African American male professors they 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 kind of have a kind of very similar. They're different, but there's just not as much diversity that I see among the African-American women. And we're already, um, there's a low number of black faculty members um, here. So we need to really have this discussion with a lot of our white colleagues as well in terms of, um, of black men, because first the, our numbers are low. And then secondly, I just don't think there's just a lot of diversity of African-American men so to help black men on campus. And that's a big issue. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great thought. I mean, uh, University of Alabama, like most predominantly white institutions in the country, have a, a, a shortage uh, of black faculty mm -hmm. to serve as you know, really uh, great models for these students as they matriculate on campus. But here's an action item that I want to give you to think about. Because in the university setting, you will often hear the phrase, well, we don't know where to find them. Right, and we don't know. Just like the Wells Fargo CEO said, there isn't enough black talent, you know, out there. Who <laughs> said that two weeks ago? You know, which makes you shake your head. But one of the things that you know I've been successful in doing in 
um, we need to think about is the hiring officials, whether it's in uh, local departments, uh, colleges at the university, or you know, even on student affairs side and business affairs side, we have to bring front and center to them uh, the information on where they can find this talent because no longer can they say, we don't know where to look because they're just gonna look at all the places where they looked before and didn't find any. And you know, part of that's on purpose, but when you provide that information to them where that talent can be found, but then here's the other thing, and then I'll turn it to Dr. Erskine, is that not only showing them where they can find the talent, but then show them how it can enhance that department or how it can enhance that bottom line you know, at the university, because most people move when they see a benefit for them. So not only do we show them where they can find the talent, but we also have to show what's the benefit of having more black male faculty on campus. You know, well, Dr. Lewis, you know, you, know they, you know, it's complex and they got to get yeah. through the search committee. A lot oh. of them do apply, <laughs> but they don't make it through that right. particular uh, process. And then it was something else you said. I just, it, it, it left. It. Well, that's why I was saying like on those search committees that you were talking about. Is, so what's the benefit? Because if the benefit like of a faculty member coming to a department, if they see the benefit of here's what a talent is and you know, this person can bring in $10 million in grants, you know, they're gonna look at it much different than, okay, this is just a normal search process. So this is why I'm saying that I think they look at it as what's going to be the benefit to them as a department. Yeah. But uh, in terms of black men, that's very low on the list. Right. Uh, and I'm just being real with that. Um, right. So uh, it's not it's not an issue about them being out there. And then also when you bring them, you have to retain them. So yeah, right. this issue is a university issue with hiring and retention. If we could get that straight we can do the other work, but not until you do that first. Right, and, and I'll turn it to Dr. Erskine and I'll say this last comment on that, is that if you wanna facilitate that change, you have to go directly to who you consider the decision maker in that particular process, right? So if we're just doing it faculty on faculty, you know, they can just hide a, you know, behind the mantra, well, I don't make the final decision. Right. So right. then you go to the person who makes the final decision and, and make that argument uh, as well. So that's just a thought to put forward. Uh, Dr. Erskine, you want to add to that? Uh, Dr. Harris, I do want to um, echo some of the things that Dr. Lewis said and then highlight some of the things that you said, uh, especially about preaching to the choir, um, that I do believe that these conversations are so needed in our community among us before we have them with our white counterparts because we'll get on the platform and we'll start changing the fabric of the speech. Um, we are learning um, with the unjust justice system that we have today that just because we look alike does not mean we all have the same mindset as it relates to um, the progression of our people. And so we have a uh, attorney general in Kentucky who never brought up uh, murder charges, never brought up those type of things with Breonna Taylor's case. And I could go on and on about people who look like us. And I could start from the pulpit and work my way to the faculty at the University of Alabama or across this country. I believe that there are conversations we must continue to have among us so that once we have those conversations with our counterparts, we're all saying the same thing. Now, of course, the preacher in me emerges by saying uh, that there is a thought in scripture that says we must say the same thing. I believe that our community, like our churches, are segmented because we're not saying the same thing. And I believe that what you're saying, Dr. Harris, is echoed among Black faculty and staff, not only at the University of Alabama, but also across this country. So let's start a real conversation across universities. What did you do that was successful at University of North Carolina at Charlotte? What did you do at Auburn? What did you do at, at uh, Diller? And let's really talk about how we can change the fabric. Because if we don't do that 10 years from now, 20 years 
pronoun. As our young black males are graduating college, they will be swayed to other places rather than the most prominent place, a University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, uh, where legends are made. If that is so, why aren't we leading, not just on the academic, uh, on the athletic fields, why aren't we leading in the academic arena as well? I think that that's not only for U.S. faculty, Dr. Harris, but also stakeholders like myself who are connected to the university in such a way, but I'm not connected to the university. Where well, I can say to systems that support the university, the president of Regents Bank, the president of these companies that have major relationships and partnerships with the university to help steer them in the direction in which we really want this ship to go. There are just, there, I'm just, there are just some faculty that would never be on board because I of, agree. Because, I of their, agree. because of their socialization. They wouldn't know what a village looked like if you put it in front of <laughs> I agree. So, so I just say that to say that um, I'm not worried about those. I'm not worried. I, I, I cannot persuade or change because sure. they're going to be who they are. And I, sure. and I just think we have a lot of them on, on, on campus. That's all. Yeah, it happens everywhere, you know, and, yes. and knowing that, knowing that, uh, you just factor that into the strategy going forward. Thank you. No Thank problem. you. Okay, do we have anyone else who had uh, a question or comment that they would like to address the panel with? I'll pause if you need a few moments to get your microphone. I just, can you hear me? We can, thank you, Brandy. Yes, my name is Brandy Miller. I'm from Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. And I just, I should put my camera on so you can see what I look like, <laughs> sorry. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you all for inviting me um, and our, our employees here to attend. This was amazing. Um, I don't have any questions. Um, we are a predominantly white institution. Um, and so we have a very small black student population. Um, the lady who spoke earlier talked about the black men that she ends up mentoring. I found that I was hoping more black women would want to be mentored by me, but it seems like the women kind of are the girls. They just don't really move my direction, but the, some of the guys do. And I thought, well, maybe it's because I might remind them of their mom or something. And maybe it feels like mom away from home. Right. But we certainly need more black male men to step up and do things like what you're suggesting on our campuses, but even within our community um, beyond the campus, because there's some men that won't make it to a college campus. We want them still to have homes and better jobs and, and things of that nature. But I just want to say this was amazing and I'm, it's breathtaking. So I thank you. The faith piece of it too is very inspiring and encouraging. Um, I have three sons. And I just wish they could have heard all of this. And I wish they had a team of people that would wrap their arms around them and, and help them um, to become the best men they can be. So thank you for the work you're doing and have a wonderful day. Well, Brandon, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And all of your uh, coworkers there at Drake, we had quite a few in the registration. Uh, if you will continue to follow the Black faculty and staff on Facebook, we're going to actually upload the video so you can sit down and watch this with your son and continue the conversation. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank, so, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we had another hand raised. Her name was Ashley. Ashley, if you would unmute and, and uh, turn your microphone on, please. Hello. Um, my name is Ashley. I'm a student at the University of Alabama. Um, I wanted to thank both you, uh, Mr. Lewis and uh, Reverend Erskine for doing this today and also uh, Mr. Jackson for setting this up. This is a really uh, engaging in conversation that we had and I, I've learned a lot through this conversation. Um, I did have one question though. Um, regarding the earlier discussion that you had, uh, I believe, I can't remember her name, Dr. Uh, Harris, you guys talked about like, diversity and the teaching and who's teaching the lessons and not only from different backgrounds and but different you know areas and stuff. And how do we kind of incorporate a diverse education, but also ensure that every student at the University of Alabama, whether they're black, white, African-American, um, 
Native American, whatever, how do we ensure that they get a diverse education while still being able to become a successful person in the work field? I don't know. So that's all I had. Yeah, that, that's a great question, uh, Ashley. Thank you for asking that. And when you look at the role of the university, the reason why I started off with that mission of, about the university, uh, the, the university is so large, any university, you know, it's a complex organization. And so with the limited number of black faculty on campus, it's hard to make sure every student crosses paths with each one of those. And it's a, you know, a, a unbearable burden on the black and brown faculty to, to hold that weight. Uh, but when you look at this, this is why it's important to have diversity in the curriculum, in the academic programs. You know, but even if they don't have a faculty of color, you know, there is a diversity of thought and opinion uh, you know, in the different respective fields of study. And as we look at that, you know, this is why where the, the power of the student um, is, is very important because, you know, in this day and age where students can, you know, promote the kind of ideals that, it, that they want in the student experience, this is why you talk with, you know, faculty and, you know, your administrators at the university when you don't feel like you're getting that kind of experience through the academic programming. You know, then they, you know, then uh, once that, those kind of issues are raised with the appropriate stakeholders at the university, then they can do what they call curriculum revisions, you know, and add new courses and add the types of things that enrich the experience and, you know, in your Department of Student Affairs, make sure they bring the speakers to the campus, you know, to make sure that uh, those topics of importance are part of that experience you know, at the university as well. So the students have uh, much more power than they, they know they have. And uh, just a FYI, so you can know that every uni university, uh, part of the tuition dollars that funds, you know, student affairs and academic affairs, you know, uh, is returned back to students for student programming through uh, organizations, fraternities and sororities and other uh, programs and, and groups that are on campus. And you could utilize those funds to make sure that the curriculum is enhanced by what you can bring to the table uh, as well. So those are just a few thoughts that you can think about uh, as well about making sure everybody has a diversity uh, of thought um, and a uh, particular program and that they can experience while at University of Alabama. Dr. Erskine. Yes, um, one of the things I believe that God married um, Dr. Lewis and I together on these projects is because we understand our lanes and I don't try to veer deeply into the academic lane that I know he is um, so um, distinguished in. Um, but I do believe, Ashley, that your question um, is so prevalent among African-American students, Native American students, and, and those students of color, because I have a son who sits in that same seat. Um, he says, all I do is go to class, and I come back to my, my dorm or I go back to my apartment. He said, but there is no real structured campus life for us. And I said to him, I said, well, what have I taught you? And I've always taught our children that if it is not there, then it is your responsibility to start to create it. You may be perhaps that you ought to start the conversation around it. I will say this too, Ashley, to you as a student, and I will um, echo what Ms. Brandon Miller said from Drake University, is that black men, black male students gravitate, as she said, to the, uh, as Dr. Harris also mentioned, to those sisters on campus because it is a nurturing process. It reminds them of home. And as Dr. Lewis said, many of them will have finished elementary, middle school, and high school and not seen one Black teacher in their entire education career. So when they get to college and they see you all, they easily gravitate to you because you remind them of a home that they left and a normalcy that they need. <clears throat> I'll say this, Ashley. Uh, one of the things I did for our son and that I'm praying um, will be developed across the country, Dr. Lewis and I and the University of Alabama and other systems, that we can create a faith-based project that works alongside of those students of color. 
Uh, I had several churches in the Huntsville area partner with me so that my son and other students of color could have an outlet. Maybe not on campus, but we can gather at church or we can gather when they have a pizza party or they gather us together for mentoring. Uniquely, Dr. Lewis will remember this, uh, at Shallow and College Station, Bryan College Station, we developed what we call College Sunday. And we invited all of the students, African-American, Native American, whomever, we invited them to come to our church campus on that particular Sunday once a month and they got a home cooked meal by some family in our church. And they absolutely loved it. Our church grew uh, to have over 705 active college students uh, during my tenure there. And the unique thing for them was it was, it felt like home. I felt like I was a part of a real community outside of um, the community that I left. And so perhaps that would be a solution that I will offer for you. I know everyone does not have the same faith persuasion. I know some people do not have um, faith in their equation at all, but I am saying that there are some dynamics that we were able to set up to where even if they didn't come on Sundays, there were Monday through Friday opportunities where they could come to the actual church campus to our educational building and mentor young students. Uh, it said a lot and it, they, it gave a lot um, both ways. It allowed them to cross pollinate and to receive uh, from those young students what they needed. And then those young students were able to see college students who looked like them giving back. So I believe that ultimately, uh, if the faith community can play a major role in it, connecting those churches and faith institutions around those universities to spawn some of these conversations and relationships as well. Dr. I'm, I'm happy that you said that because, um, you know, over the past 20 years, I've noticed, especially and, and especially with the millennials and Generation Z, that and in being at a public institution, you know, a lot of our students um, do not have the experience of going to church. Uh, they're very distrust. They're distrustful of yeah. um, church leaders and the church. Yes. Very unlike my experience. Um, um, I, this was about 20 years ago, and I teach communication. And I was, uh, and then I, 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 I like to tell this story. And I, a young man um, was asking what. Uh, he should wear for the presentation. I was like professional clothes, business casual or whatever. And then, you know, he, he still wasn't get, getting it. And, right. and, and I said, well, what do you wear to church? Okay. And he said, I, I've never been to church, you know? Yeah. And so I do think that when you do have students, and we're in the South, so you see it a lot more. I'm a product of two historically black colleges, Clark Atlanta and Howard. And um, so, you know, I think about all the activities on campus and a lot of them were uh, surrounded uh, around faith-based type activities. I see at the University of Alabama, we have um, white students that are very active right. in faith-based different types of diversity. Not so much I've seen here for the black students, but I think it is because there's a disconnect there from um, them and the church. Um, yes. So that that does become that does become an issue, especially for black men. And Dr. trying to pull them into some type of mentoring relationship. Dr. Harris, let me echo what you just said, because my mentor helped me with this particular issue. And he said to me that you have to look at the paradigm in which people come from. It's hard to say to them, OK, when you get to college, go to church. Well, if I hadn't been going to church, prior to going to college, there is a 100% chance that I'm not going to go once I get there. Um, people gravitate to the normals um, that have been present in their lives. Um, and I have young men, sadly, this 41 year old young man, um, his life was taken on last night. He was, a, he was known as a, a, a thug. He was a street guy and, and proud of it in those days. But his life changed. And I asked him, uh, he passed away on last night, which was Wednesday night. And Tuesday, we spent most of the afternoon together. He had just sold his home. He broke all of the molds 
uh, that Dr. Lewis was talking about. He was a homeowner. He had just sold his home. He was getting ready to launch his own business. He had turned away from um, a life of crime and all of that and, and his past. And I said to him, what was the thing that made you come in? And perhaps this will help with other African-American males I know and other African-American students and students of color. He said, because you were real. I believe that church sometimes presents itself, faith presents itself with a cookie cutter mindset for ministry or um, the projection of what they see on television. And I said to him, uh, you came in trusting. You came in, he said, because you let all the walls down and you let your guard down and you talked to me like I was a, a man and I could see you as a man. But I also had young men that said, well, listen, I don't want nothing to do with the church. You know, all y'all preachers are out for yourselves. Y'all nothing but pulpit pimps. And, you know, all you're doing is fleecing the flock. And I said, well, it's amazing. You don't trust me. You don't know me. You place judgments on me. I said, but one thing about it, you go to the club and you can't trust the people in the club. You go to you go to the strip club. That woman doesn't love you. You giving her your money and all she giving to you is selling you a fantasy. So if you're going to do, if you're going to place those judgments on the church and you got to place those judgments on everywhere you go. And if you're going to do that, you can't go anywhere. You're going to be secluded to yourself. And ultimately, I believe the transparency is the key that allows them to, uh, to create. I think Dr. Erskine, 70, 70 to 85 percent of them. And, and, I, and I agree because I, I think one of the things that um, I don't think that uh, my mentors, especially black men, are are, are um, we're brought into relationship because I am because I'm very much the opposite. I would think of this real nurturing. I think that's why I don't attract the uh, the traditional um, mother. I think it is because my transparency and my realness and to right. ask tough questions and to accept them, meet them where they are, meet them where they are That's key. Um, and, and try to understand who they are and not try to make them into something that I have in my head because I don't, because I recognize that there are a lot of small T's. There's just not one big T. And I think, um, black male students are are, are, are are if they don't see how they can fit in to right. this um, this model and I think a lot of times academics we we um, uh, and I'm just going to include myself because I'm a part of it although I don't think that I do it that if you didn't do it my way then it's not, you can't be successful but there okay. are so many different paths and avenues for them to do it but realness and transparency and talking about my weaknesses and talking about where I failed um, is, is very important in pulling them in to develop that type of relationship. Most definitely. Thank you. And it seems like we have, and uh, thank you all so much for um, answering that question. And I also want to invite Ashley to get engaged with some of the student activity and involvement on campus. Uh, Black faculty and staff uh, specifically, we have student-centered programming to make sure that you're successful while you're in school. And we also have partnered, uh, Dr. Erskine, you may remember uh, when you did the professional development day, we partnered with Renaissance Bank. And yes. that very next fall, we were able to get a student employed that was uh, associated with the Black faculty and staff, a student initiative. So yes. um, you have to somewhat bear a little bit of the accountability with that to make sure you're involved. Again, bfsa.ua.edu. Or if you would like, send me an email and I can get you in touch with our mentors, the individuals that have programming and have campus knowledge uh, on the UA. We've been waiting. I know I, I saw another hand up. Uh, Jason Williams, if you would unmute and turn the camera on and ask your question, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, Hi, I'm Jason Williams. I'm a student. I'm a sophomore here at UA. Um, I'm actually a news media student and I just wanted to ask y'all a couple questions. Um, uh, first question is, uh, what do you think 
was the tipping point for you both to end up writing your book, uh, the, Dilemma, the Dilemmas of Being an African American Male in the New Millennium? What do you think was the tipping for, point for y'all to write this book for people to read? Uh, that's a great question, Jason, and thanks for asking that. I mean, when you look at the passion that Dr. Erskine and I bring to the table, uh, you know, you can see all the media images on TV talking about all what's wrong, uh, but very few people uh, bring solutions to the table. And one of the things we've come to understand is that for some people, uh, they will not give it any cred credibility unless it's written. And so in, in putting it in the book for people to digest and you know, read and, and consider, you know, one of the things we wanted to do is to reach the largest number of people that we could with viable solutions uh, for African-American males in a way that was tangible for them to find themselves you know, as stakeholders so they can implement uh, those solutions uh, in those communities. So that's one of the reasons why we got to the point where we led where we were led to write the book. And, you know, Dr. Erskine could tell you when we talked about it, we wrote the book, you know, so fast, you know, because it was just building up inside of us. I think we wrote the entire book in like six weeks, you know, from, from idea to uh, publication, because we just had to get it out of us uh, as well. Jason, also, I want to, uh, I want to thank you for your question, um, but I also want to say to you, my tipping point along with uh, Dr. Lewis was that I had a, uh, at that time, I had a uh, three, four-year-old son. Uh, my wife and I had moved from Birmingham, Alabama to College Station, Texas, where I had another assignment at another church. And I had moved in my life from trying to reach a destiny to leaving a legacy. And when I met Dr. Lewis and he began to say, share with me Pastor, these are some wonderful sermons. They are moving, they are energetic, they are inspirational and intellectual. But we got to get in print form so that we can speak even when we're no longer here. And I believe that that is um, the, the tipping point and hallmark of why we wrote the book uh, and why it is so successful um, because it spans a conversation over genres over time so that no matter what happened, if it is a Trayvon Martin or whether it is a George Floyd, so many years distance between the two, but this book addresses those situations so heart, heartfelt and transparent um, that it can't be dated. And so for me, uh, also with my friend uh, at his bidding, it was that I was looking at a son that I knew would grow up into some stereotypes. And I wanted him to have what I did not have. I wanted other young black boys to have and other black men to have what was sometimes not afforded to us. And that was solutions. Everybody talked about the problems, but not so much the solutions. And, and Jason, I have one selfish fact I want to add too. I have two daughters. <laughs> so I <laughs> want to make the, the ground fertile <laughs> for, for when, they, when they meet their future husbands as well. So I want to make sure I play my part as well. So I just want to throw that in. <laughs> okay. Um, another question. Um, what do you think like the progression looks like as far as like mentoring for young African-American males like me? Like what do you think the progression from like mentors to me and then from people my age to the generation who will be after me. What do you think that that looks like? What do you think that that looks like? Yeah, well, the, the mentor, and I, I think one of the things that um, as we laid out solutions, you know, there are um, mentoring kind of situations that have to happen along what we call an education, along the educational pipeline, right? So mentoring looks a little different when a kid is in elementary school versus when, you know, he's in high school. And then once you get to that college campus, you know, the, the needs of the black male uh, emerge differently along the different stages of life. And so when a person like yourself gets to the University of Alabama, you, you have new thoughts about, you know, what I want to do as a career and what do I want to do, 
you know, leaving my legacy at that university, but then also, you know, what is my legacy for those who have come behind me, given the tradition of, of that university and uh, uh, the, the range of history of how students have been treated over time and what it took for Jason Williams to have a good experience at the university. Uh, I think it looks different, but when you start to look at that, uh, along that particular pipeline uh, for you, the mentorship has to have the same ingredient at all levels. It has to meet the need of the uh, African-American male in the context of what he sees at his reality at that given time. And once that need is met, then that mentoring experience around that then takes shape, like Dr. Erskine and I said, at a long hour past when the men stepped in our lives, you know, and, and pulled us under their wing to show us what it took to be successful. And the women along the way from our mothers to yes. some of those people in the pathway, you know, they provided what we needed at the time that we needed. And, and so when you start to look at what does uh, Jason Williams and other students like uh, Jason at the university need, this is why uh, the, the programming and the support has to be in place because reality is a difference. Because you, in college, you're thinking about your life after, where you came from, and where I am now. You know, and that's a unique context that has to have a mentoring relationship that's tied to that. Jason, I'll add to that. Um, I believe you, this generation is doing it now. I believe uh, the Jason Williams at the University of Alabama's. I believe that the Christian Erskins at the University of Alabama at Huntsville. I believe that the young lady who is a African-American student at Auburn and uh, University of Tennessee, and I can go around the, the Southeast and around the country. I believe it's mobilization. And the best example of that is um, the passing, uh, right before the passing of John Lewis, uh, who I was, who we were privileged to host at Shiloh in Texas. He came there um, with Senate, uh, Congressman Chet Edwards and we hosted him at our church. And for some of the young black male students and young female black students to call me after his passing and say, Pastor Erskine, we met him as teenagers. We met him as third and fourth graders at our church. And to see a John Lewis, who was one of the uh, pillars of the civil rights movement, join hands with Black Lives Matter. I believe it, it set a fire and a passing of the baton, if you will, to the next generation. I believe what did not successfully happen from a Martin Luther King to either a Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton or whomever, was that the baton was not passed with an endorsement. I believe John Lewis endorsed this next generation to be active, to be activists and to assume uh, activism as a part of your academia, that it shouldn't be separate, that the two should go together. And that as he endorsed it for Jason Williams, now your responsibility is to carry that torch, carry that baton to the next generation and pass it off with the same responsibilities. Uh, when I was growing up, my parents and grandparents would meet Friday nights at my grandmother's house, grandfather's house. And I would sit around as a little boy and listen to them tell the same stories. And many of you have the same uh, concept, the same stories over and over and over again. Well, what I didn't know was that they were educating me on behalf of our family and our lineage and our heritage and where we as a people had come from and what we were able to do as a family. So they were in a sense, proverbially passing the torch to me now that I'm able to pass it to my son, our son and our daughter, uh, who is uh, academic scholar as well, um, and they have a responsibility, a mandate on them to pass it to the next generation and not drop it. Uh, I'll close Jason with this. Miles Monroe says that a great leader does not die with the baton in their hand. Uh, we have a generation 
that is older who feels that they cannot release the baton because they've held it for so long. But if the baton dies in your hand, so does the movement. And so that's why I believe a Black Lives Matter has emerged to say that we're taking on that spirit of activism from our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents. And there are some things that we want to cross the finishing line that they started at the starting gate. Okay, thank you. Uh, since, since we're speaking about uh, mentors, I want to highlight a person that I, I see on the um, webinar today, uh, Dr. Charles Nash. Uh, he's with the UA Systems Office. Uh, many times he took the Black scholar students uh, to the side and mentored them uh, and brought them into his home. Dr. Nash, if, if you will, can you uh, speak on to that as to why that was important for you and why you did it for so many years? And we want to publicly say thank you, not, a, not that you have retired, but thank you so kindly for uh, that example for us. So Chad, I stepped away for a moment because someone was at my front door. So I may have missed the essence of your question. Would you quickly say what you asked me to do again, please? Sure, sure, thank you. I was saying, we were speaking about um, mentorship and have a role model. Uh, and I brought up the fact that you, for so many years, uh, took in the Black scholars from BFSA into your yes. home. And you made sure, even though you weren't exactly on campus, but you were with the UA Systems Office, you still made yourself available to those students in an intimate way. So I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to explain what is that like? And, and echoing Dr. Erskine, how do you encourage someone else to pass the baton and do the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity, Chad. I, I, I just think it was a blessing for me and for, for Hattie, my, my wife and I, when we invited our senior scholars, we had folks from the Honors College and we had from the Black faculty and staff scholars come to our house to have a conversation. One, one of the things that I missed the most moving from a campus as a dean to a system office was the opportunity to spend time with students, undergraduate students, graduate students, and so forth. And so the blessing was ours. I hope it helped the, the young folk who came. Uh, you remember, we, we always chose a topic, whether it was about uh, uh, voting uh, or whether it was about the Black Lives Matter type of thing, or whether it was any subject that was hot uh, in the marketplace, in the academic space, uh, and we tried to engage them. And I think it was to me to work both ways, for me to share in part some of the views that I have just based on my experience over life uh, and to get from them their perspectives on where they are now, where they were when they were with us uh, looking forward. And I think one of the things that probably drove us to wanna to do that in addition to just because we don't have that opportunity, didn't have that opportunity much, was the notion that what they see they will be. And I hoped that if we, Hattie and I, represented successful African-American people, people who came from a small town in Southwest Mississippi, who got through our privilege, privilege of having grown up with uh, siblings, grown up with moms and dads in both of our households, uh, the, the opportunity to do more than perhaps might have been expected uh, we had the privilege of having uh, probably the best school teachers in our K-12 schools when we were growing up of any teachers, black or white, and the opportunity to uh, learn from them, to grow and develop from them. It just seemed to me an obligation to share that out. Uh, and I hope I can continue to do that. So. I hope that responds to your point. Uh, again, the main thing I wanted to make the point about was that it was a privilege for me to be able to engage our young folk, uh, and I hope it helped them as well. Yes, sir. And thank you, Dr. Nash. Uh, we will continue to do that since you just uh, stated that you wanted to. It may be a video. I do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it on a virtual platform, but we, we do understand, and as, as this panel has uh, brought it forth, so intricately, we do understand the importance of having that representation from one generation to the next and just so they can see what they what the end result could look like for them as well. And thank you again. 
Uh, so how would you encourage the next, the people, the next, how would you, I said, how would I say, how would you like to pass the baton for someone else to share in that based on the conversations you've heard today? Is that my question again, Chad? I think it is, yes. Okay, yeah, well, I, I think we have to be present. You know, part of doing anything is to show up. Uh, and I think that one of the opportunities we have is as perhaps to be mentors or already mentors is to be present with folk. And, and you know, the COVID has, has put a wrinkle in that for us and it has stopped the opportunity for us to be as present as we might want to be. But I think we can take even during this time and it'll be over hopefully sooner than later, the opportunity to get back to a more present opportunity to mix and mingle with young folk and for folk to learn together. Uh, I think that's, that's so critical. But I think it was a young man, one of our students who talked um, uh, about how do, you, how do you move this from one generation to the other? Uh, and I think that part of what I've, at least from my perspective, have committed to do, as I said to the Board of Trustees when I was announced, my, when my uh, retirement was announced back in November, I said, I will stop working at some time, but I will not stop serving. Mm. And I think even folk like me, people who are older, people who've had a career of 50 years, uh, can keep on serving, keep on being present, keep on giving opportunity for young folk uh, to know where we've come from. The road hasn't been easy for us older folk the road will not be easy in every aspect for them going forward, but we can help as best we can to ensure that the road is a place, is a, a space where their bumps will be smoothed out more than bumps created in front of them. So I think continuing the pathway of service is what I'd say will help to move as generations come, as generations move, and as generations go forward. Thank you, Dr. Nash. Thank you. And as I look through the, uh, I think Dr. Harris, you had something to say? You had a comment on that? Dr. Nikita Harris? Oh no, I, um, I'm done with questions and okay. comments. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, thank you. Was there, were there any other questions before we uh, have our final statements and our closing remarks from our panelists? Anyone? I have one. Okay, thank you. Andrea? Uh, my name is Andrea Dobines. So I'm actually, no, you're fine. I'm actually a UA. Uh, two-time alum, but still get the BFSA emails because I was in BFSA as a graduate student. But my question is, what do you suggest we tell students? Because now I'm a teacher. Mm. What do you suggest we tell students of color who know, and I mean know from without me even telling them, that we didn't have the most welcoming experience? And to uh, Professor Nikita Harris's point, we didn't have exactly diverse professors either even with my master's being in gender and race studies I that's the I hate to say it like this the whitest I felt at school wow like in my African-American studies classes not all of them but the bulk of them and I understand that UA is a system it has been since 1831 but what do you tell students who aspire to go to UA or mm institutions like UA who already know that they aren't going to be greeted with open arms. Wow. Like, I, and I don't want to lie to them. So I'm asking y'all, what do I tell my students? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what a great question. And I think that's one that definitely has to uh, uh, be grappled with, with people on the ground at, at UA there. But, but one thing you can consider when you have organizations like BFSA and, you know, the the, the gentleman who just spoke, who, who mentioned of how uh, the outreach has been done to mentor people coming along the way so they can have that kind of experience. You know, those are the things that 
uh, enrich the campus in such a way that is not always promoted and advertised. And I think, you know, one of the things that BFSA and any other stakeholders that are on uh, this video conference today is, you know, you have to advertise what you do well because you're now living in a generation where uh, students are gonna check you out, you know, without talking to you, you know, on the web and, you know, other things that they can find via social media. And, you know, part of how you promote what you're doing well can actually be the reason uh, that students decide to come because they're gonna make a decision on you before they even get there, you know? And so that's why when you kind of look within and across the campus of what's going well and, you know, who are the diverse faculty and what are they doing and where are they located? Like me at a, a, at a predominantly white institution myself, you know, I pretty much have, uh, I, I feel like every student of color on campus has knocked on my door, you know, and they find me. You know what I mean? But that's what goes along with that. But in advertising what you do well, you know, I think it's going to be important. And that's what you can tell them. You can say, look at this, look at how, you know, the university is supporting students. And, and that could be probably the most powerful message that you can do is how you're marketing what's going on there that, that is going well, because we know things are not going well, no place is perfect. But if you really market those things that are valuable treasures, you know, at the university, you know, then that'll make a difference uh, as well. Dr. Lewis, if, if, if I, may, I think you're absolutely correct because I don't want to uh, let this moment pass without acknowledging that the university has made a lot of uh, stride towards that diversity. I don't want this moment to pass without acknowledging um, some of the accomplishments the University of Alabama has been able to make. But even though we still have a long way to go, and that was a statement even the university say, and my question is we have a long way to go, but what transportation model are we using to get there? That would determine whether it takes 10 years to get there or, or two minutes. But uh, we do have, like I said, we do, we, our faculty uh, numbers are up, uh, different uh, initiatives that surround diversity have been put in place. And that has actually helped the campus culture is what we're speaking of, the campus culture for both faculty, staff, and students. So just like Dr. Lewis say, uh, stated, now we have been trying to promote as much as we can. You know, we've been wearing the uh, Zoom out. We've been wearing Facebook out, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. BFSA has been everywhere. And I think to that testimony is why we have people from all over the United States on the Zoom call now. But not only that, uh, we have to ask others to actually show up with us because we want you to be a part of the success. And our success is not unto ourselves, but it's when you jump in and people who, who look like you or associate with you can say, she represents me. Now you represent us and we represent everyone. So we have to make sure that when we have those initiatives that are on the front and that, that's available, that we are present and we employ those initiatives. What we don't want to say was, listen, we tried that. You guys didn't work. No one did anything to facilitate that or bring it to the, the end result that we were looking for. That's not our cause right now. Today, we made BFSA, and I, and I apologize for the platform, but BFSA was in a crimson white twice in one day. You know what? That's not because we're sitting by. It's because we stood up and we're present and we're intentional in our presence. And while we have the microphone, we are sure that we are saying something because even though we look alike, the black experience is not monolithic. And we have to be very vocal and we have to be intentional in saying not only this is the issues, and I think that was a, a perfect outline of the book. Not only can we be present when we speak of issues, Let's be also present when we speak on resolutions and how we can uh, make sure those issues are no longer issues. Okay, I I'm sorry, I, I, I took up a little bit too much. Of <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. I see all the work BFSA is doing and it's amazing to me. Makes me want to come back and get one more degree. Hey, come on. <laughs> but, but here's the deal. We, we can't do it unto ourselves. And, and I mean to say that it can't be the same 5 or 10, 15, 20 people that's doing all the work. You know, we need your hand. We need your input. We need your insight. We need your connections. We need your networks. We need you. But I think uh, we, we, we would be remiss if we didn't at least mention that there are some strides. We have more Black faculty now. 
than we did 10 years ago. I think we're, we're at 7%, mm -hmm. which is not really anything to brag on, but that's double the number nationally. So that, that deserves some kind of acknowledgement, you know? Yes. Uh, last week, uh, BFSA, for the first time in history, has been given their own account. You got what I'm saying? So we have the uh, financial and subsidies in place for our program. So that's something that wasn't in place 10 years ago. So we have to make sure that while we're moving, that we keep on moving. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, panelists, <laughs> panelists uh, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Dr. Erste, do y'all have any uh, final words or observations? Well, just, just from my side, I, I just want to thank everyone for joining today and taking time out of your busy schedules uh, as, as we've had the opportunity to, to lay out today in the book. Um, you hear our hearts and, the, you know, hopefully you will read the book and look at some of the solutions that we put forward. Uh, we're ready and available in any way we can help, you know, serve, you know, and, and you know, be a change agent to support the work that you're doing on the ground there uh, as well. But just remember in, in any of the situations that you will face uh, in, in moving the agenda forward, you have to be solutions focused uh, if you're going to move that agenda in a meaningful way you know, at the university, because by being solution focused, then uh, when you have solutions, then that's where resource allocation happens uh, around solutions as well. So if you just take that, um, I wish you all the best and thank you again for the opportunity. Chad, I want to say to um, everyone who was on and those of you who are on now, um, how privileged I am to have this opportunity to share and to speak and to share with my friend and my brother, Dr. Chance Lewis, um, in these conversations that we've been having um, now for over 17 years. And as he said, um, it's a passion to us. It's not a project. And I believe some batons are dropped because as Dr. Nash so eloquently spoke uh, to that it is not just about your being in a position at that particular moment, but even after retiring, after stepping away from the classroom, moving to another office, you're still open to serving. And I believe that is um, paramount in our community if we're going to see the type of changes that we need. I appreciate you, uh, Chad, for echoing um, through Ms. Andrea's question what the B, what BFSA are doing right now and what's happening on campus right now. Um, I thought it was huge for Coach Saban to lead the Black Lives Matter uh, march with his students. I thought it was also apropos for Dr. Taylor to stand in that same doorway that Governor Wallace stood in some years ago and denied the first African-American Black student to attend. So I think there are wonderful strides that are being made. Um, I believe that sometimes we allow the wrong people to hijack our microphone. And Jim Collins says in his book, Good to Great, one of the problems with reaching your destination is not the driver. Sometimes you have to get the wrong people off the bus and get the right people on the bus. Wrong people on the bus will cause the driver to be distracted because they're arguing over seats and schedules and uh, how cool it is and how hot it is, the temperature. When the right people are on the bus, they don't care if they have to stand to get where they're going because what's most important is not the transportation, but the destination that we're headed to. And so I say to you and to say, I say to everyone who has participated on today um, that we, if we're going to change the narrative we got to change the narrators. And if we're going to change this narrative in our community, that all our young men are not bad, all our young black boys are not troubled. We cannot afford to allow them to label them and to um, uh, unjustly um, criminalize them and make them to become what society has labeled them to be. And that we ought to do a recruitment of the best top students in their field of study, just like the university goes after them five star athletes, I think we ought to be doing the same thing in the classroom and inviting them there.
Now, I'm not robbing from HBCUs because you have a, a Southern graduate that's sitting there in Dr. Lewis. You got a Tuskegee University product that's, that's sitting in front of you. So I'm not robbing the HBCU experience, but that's not everyone's experience. Someone will go to a PWI. And what does that fabric look like for them, for Ashley, for Jason? What do we do to make sure and ensure that they have the best experience academically that they can have? And I believe that's ultimately changing the narrators so that the narrative will fit what we desire for it to say. Thank you both so much. And um, I'm going to make a statement that was uh, unsolicited for all this listening. I'm going to invite everyone to not only purchase the book for yourself, but purchase the book for up to five male students. Uh, I want you to get to this uh, excellent chapter that says readers become leaders. Get to that point and then call me. But I want everyone not only to have this book for themselves. And Dr. Nash, I saw your thumbs up. We, we're going to get you to get 10 books, okay? I know you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to make sure that we put this book in the hands of the um, some Black male students, and not only Black male students, but any student. And let's have some um, continued conversation. And maybe this can help uh, those in, in those conversations, we can address some of the gaps that's in policy and make necessary change. Uh, I want to thank uh, Black Faculty and Staff Association. I see many of our members here. I thank the uh, Black Faculty and Staff Executive Board. I see you. Thank you kindly. The University of Alabama staff and faculty, thank you again. To our uh, honored guests and our fellow uh, Black Faculty and Staff Associations all over uh, the United States, I see you all these colleges and universities and HBCUs, you guys are present, present and we thank you. I had a chance to kind of look over at Facebook to see what was going on. And there are, I think, 19 watch parties. So you may look at the number here and saw that there was uh, 39 was the top. But we this event has been shared uh, 19 times and the watch parties all over. And we want to thank everyone. And I want to uh, make sure that we continue the conversation. Uh, this book will be on BFSA's platform. We'll be on the page if you want to donate a book. If you want to, uh, that information will be there. And we thank you all. Again, you all have a great day. Again, we want to thank our panelists for such a scholastic review and uh, of the topic that we needed to discuss, the plight, the path, and the progression of the Black man. And um, with that being said, thank you all. Everyone have a blessed day. This should be available uh, for our reproduction on tonight. So we will put it up on our um, social media platform so you can review this event tonight. Thank you all so kindly. And again, five books for five students and one for yourself, okay? Thank you ever so kindly. You all have a great day. <laughs>